All right, so uh, thanks for coming, everyone. And obviously, uh, some of you have traveled further than, than others. But uh, perhaps we start with you, VJ, and just introducing Transformate Global Payments uh, and that your role in the company and, and what Transformate does. Hi, my name is uh, Vijay Rao, and I take care of uh, APAC for Transformate. So Transformate is a global payments uh, company, cross-border payments. That's, uh, that's our focus, B2B cross-border. And uh, we've been in Australia for about five, five years now, and we've got a few hundred customers in Australia. And I look forward to sharing more as we go along. Hayley. Uh, I'm Hayley Fisher. I'm the Adyen Country Manager for Australia and New Zealand. And Adyen is a global fintech platform, and we help uh, leading businesses process payments across online, in-store, in-app. Uh, we were founded in the Netherlands in 2006, and we opened our Australian office in Sydney in 2015. And lastly, Ruben. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruben from Singapore Fintech Association. So yes, we do have to travel about a good eight hours to get here. And what we do is that we are the Fintech Australia equivalent in Singapore, and we have supporting about 800 corporate members and about another 1,600 individual members. And basically what we do is to support our members to, to, su to succeed, as well as to support Singapore to be a Fintech hub. Thank you all. Um, so we're here to talk about global first approach, and I think um, without further ado, we'll crack on. Um, to the guys that were in the, in the tech startups, what does global first mean to you? Right, so, so I guess from our own experience, we started in Ireland about 10 years ago, and uh, we grew, we grew from, from Ireland, but the, but the systems that we were working on, cross-border payments, is something that, that is by its very nature global. So you have to, uh, almost from, from day one, think about, think about sending payments to, to Australia, to, uh, uh, to, to Malaysia, to Hong Kong. So we were almost automatically global and to Singapore, right? So, so that is the very nature. You sit in your, uh, we sit in our, uh, our quiet rooms, but you can hear the, the whistle of the ships and the roar of the trucks as they load and unload. So it, it's, a, it's a vital part of the global economy. And uh, as we can, as we have seen, you know, the supply chain, uh, problems cause causes problem not in one country but across the globe. So, so by its very nature, the business was global. Uh, so when you build out the system, you we had to think about the entire world, not just one particular country, um, and certainly take into cognizance all the challenges that we would have across the globe, the AML challenges, dealing with the regulators, etc. Yeah, we can relate. Um, I think for, for Adyen, having a global first approach was a get-go from when we founded the company. Um, I think if you, and you know much about payments, the payment landscape is really um, convoluted. So there's lots of archaic um, architecture. It's very mismatched. Uh, nothing's connected together. So our founders created Adyen and built a single platform which works globally for global merchants. So whether that is adding a new payment method, adding a new country, products, features, it's all developed on the global platform. So when we build it, it works for merchants, whether they're based here, Singapore, or somewhere else. So um, it's been yeah, the core of our business, and that's been our strategy the whole time. And Ruben, for you, in uh, developing the FinTech ecosystem in Singapore and expanding it globally, what are the sort of tips and common patterns or perhaps gaps that you see in the Singaporean businesses when they're trying to scale global first. Before I begin, quick show of hands, how many of you actually been to Singapore or know Singapore? Oh, wow, nice. <laughs> right, so if you guys do know, we are actually really, really small. We are pathetically small. We are not even bigger than the lake in some countries, in New Zealand for that matter. So to that question, Singapore companies, whenever they start a business in Singapore, they have to think global. And I think it's really the, very much the 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 nature of Singapore and, and the way um, for the past 50 years our economy has been set up. So maybe just to give you some numbers, um, don't quote me on that, I mean it's not, it's not entirely 100% accurate but um, so in Singapore right now with us we have about 800 corporate members and of that um, only about 30-40% to 40 of these fintech companies are actually start originated from Singapore and they are like 
Singapore founded, Singapore started. But yet many of them who are in Singapore are actually from other countries, including like so Australia, US, Israel, um, China. So that really makes Singapore very exciting because you really have the best of all these different businesses and different fintech solutions coming into Singapore. And thereafter, um, which is why most all Singapore companies really have the global mindset because you really cannot just depend on Singapore to survive. But what it helps is that if your business case is tested in Singapore and is validated and you get the li if you're licensed, uh, if you're under the regulatory guidelines and you are licensed, it gives you a very strong testament. It helps in your valuation. It helps in the way you maneuver the market. So really, I think a lot of people use Singapore as a test bit. And I think on top of that, um, it's really about, um, you look at uh, Southeast Asia as well. I, I don't like to lose the ASEAN, but look at Southeast Asia as well. So Southeast Asia is not exactly a simple market to navigate because uh, it would be wrong to assume it's actually one market. It's actually made of 10, separate, 10, 10 different countries with different languages and culture as well, and even 10 different currencies. And we do have different time zones as well. So I think the good thing about Singapore being a global, regional approach is that firstly, people come to Singapore to try their business, to find partnerships, to go into Southeast Asia. Singapore men are also doing that. And in terms of the problems that we have, um, sometimes we, we, we do need to form more partnership because, um, you know, I think that applies to all of us for that matter. Many times when you want to go global, we tend to think too much about our background. And you realize that actually when you go to different countries, it's actually very, very different in the way doing business. So even the way doing business in Australia will not be the same as doing it in, in Singapore. So let me just stop there. Thank you. Um, so on that point, um, when considering expanding globally, what's the balance that your company's made in terms of trying to create uh, a local culture in the markets that you've been in? Uh, and are there any things that are worth bringing up to, for the audience in terms of how to balance that growth? and? think about values and, and cultural differences in expanding your, your teams? Yeah, so when we, uh, when we launched in Australia, uh, we base it on our merchant demand. So we had global merchants looking at processing and wanting to process in Australia. Uh, so we sent one of our Dutch colleagues to Australia and he opened our office in Sydney. Um, and then we built the team around him. So we started with sales, account management, and then built in support implementation from there. So, it was really important to bring the knowledge and the experience of Adyen to Australia, but just as important to localise and hire local experts um, and have them part of our team. Um, and then you mentioned culture. Obviously, a, a huge, important thing for Adyen. Um, we have the Adyen formula, and as part of that culture is ensuring that we localise that culture here as well. So making sure that that global culture mission fits in with Australia. So we did a lot of work to make sure it works here as well. So, so it was a combination of uh, the, the skills that we had, the experience that we had out of Ireland, uh, together with hiring almost, almost But at the same time, we do have uh, people coming down from, from Ireland to share their experiences and their knowledge, particularly about uh, you know, how the systems work, uh, which is very unique in the payments industry, particularly the cross-border payments industry. I will just also add in there, um, besides sending someone from Amsterdam, it's also really important to have things like exchange programs. So there's so much knowledge from global headquarters and different countries with skills and experience and you know, experience in different countries. So um, we often bring people over from other countries on exchanges, whether that's just understanding products better or understanding a market such as LATAM. Um, and it works really well. It means that people within your company get to travel, they get to have more experiences, and then they bring that back to their um, home country as well. So, great experience. Yeah, interesting. Like, one of the biggest challenges we've seen in, in the work we've done over the years is that first onboarding phase. Um, is the strategies that your Global First organisations have adopted in terms of making sure that the, the staff are embedded correctly in their first few weeks in? Yeah, I think uh, we have a, a comprehensive onboarding problem. So that uh, pro program, so uh, an employee would join us. They go through an induction program. They go through uh, um, local in, um, onboarding as well. So it would be it would be a joint onboarding between all the different uh, units within Transformate. Uh, 
uh, both locally and, uh, and out of Ireland. And we have, we're very aligned, so we have exactly the same. Uh, we have a fixed onboarding program where the teams in the Asia Pacific region get together in Singapore for a week of onboarding, and that carries over for the first three months and then onwards. So it's just a really nice way to get to know your colleagues in other offices, in other teams, um, and I think it really helps you to help them to ramp up to be able to make impact on your business. Totally. So in terms of uh, ramping up, and obviously feel free to answer as well, Ruben, here. Um, what are the nuances or differences you've seen in terms of creating brand presence in those new markets when we've got language barriers and we've got different entry points through different partners uh, that you've seen that work well for Singapore as a region? Um, I guess for a start, um, it's very important to identify your own product and business. So are you B2B or B2C? And in different contexts, you do need different form of brand and marketing. And I think we heard this kind of stories many, many times before. Um, but more importantly is to always look, understand the local nuances. Because even the likes of Nike, um, you're talking about big global FMCG brand, they still make the same mistakes in not understanding local context well enough. You know, if you recall, there was a sneaker that was made, uh, I think for the Middle East market, and there was some name of the, uh, if I'm not wrong, was Allah, you know, and it was at the bottom of the shoe. You know, and so there was, then there was a lot of this cultural misappropriation. So I think it's really, in terms of branding, firstly, is identi identify really, are you a B2B, B2C? Who are your target audience? Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges in the B2C space that you identify in today, especially in Singapore and Australia and other parts of the world, is that you're seeing five generations of your consumer existing at one time, from your boomer to Gen X, Y, Z, and then alpha. You know, so and then it's where then th that becomes a lot more tricky. But the beautiful thing in marketing as well in today's context is that you have a lot more new ways. So in Singapore, one of the new trends that we are seeing now is using NFT. So how do you use NFT? So it's not just only about buying and selling and keeping it um, as a souvenir, but really how do you use that to be a community and how do you use that to, to, if, to bring about a new way for people who are sick and tired of other ways of marketing. Thank you. And guys, uh, maybe specifically for Australia, is there anything different or nuances that you've seen here in terms of creating that brand presence that differ from the, the rest of the Asia-Pac region? Not really, because when we think about PR and marketing, um, our brand promise is to remain consistent on a global mm. basis. So uh, we're a global company, we have global merchants, and we expect... I think those merchants expect to have the same ad gen experience, whether they're looking at a marketing advert mm. in Australia or a TV advert in the UK. Um, but then in saying that, we still localize. So we still need to make sure whatever we're doing in marketing and PR, it works for this market. Yeah. So taking in a, you know, unique needs, maturity of the market, those types of things. I think the systems and processes are consistent, but certainly how you address the market, uh, uh, con Making sure that the the messages are in contextual to the to the local market that was really that's really critical. Thank you. Um, one of the biggest challenges, obviously, for any business as it scales, whether it's global first or not, is attracting those first customers. And importantly, in Australia and and elsewhere in bigger markets in the world, it's that push to get the first big logo. Um, other nuances in your global first approach, where you believe you know are no brainers for perhaps the Aussie startups that are out here today that they need to consider in terms of trying to get that first logo on the, on the books? Yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that today we do have uh, huge uh, global logos with us. SAP is, uh, is an example, some of the larger banks, Wells Fargo, et cetera. And, and it was really to be able to, it's really about delivering value to, the, to your customers, delivering value to your partners. Um, and, and that's, that's what you, you need to identify uh, first and foremost, and then keeping the message simple, if you like. You should be, get it, you should be able to get it down to three points, which we do, uh, and then deliver it in a consistent way across the different markets in Australia, in, in Sydney, in Melbourne, and as you, as you venture out of Australia uh, across the globe. Anyway, that's the same. So we look at the... When expanding in Australia, we look at the verticals we're strong in globally. So traditionally, Adyen's very strong in retail, high-end retail. So looking about who are those standout brands that we would like to work with and have as a logo. So uh, the team worked very hard to get those, and we're proud to work with a large number of Australian retailers today. I'm not going to name them all today, though. <laughs> but I think it's really key of knowing what you're going after and having that plan and then building on that success with that to be signing the next one and the next one. 
So going global is actually a very interesting concept in Singapore because there are actually a good number of Singapore companies that are registered in Singapore, housed in Singapore, but they don't sell in Singapore. They don't. So, so for to some of the founders, C-suites here today, and then you're looking at international globalizing your business, regionalizing your business, have a thing about structuring. So it is important at the back on how do you structure your business in terms of where is your shareholding, how do you do and do transfer pricing, how do you do licensing, how do you move your money around. And that's very important because as you go global, if you do not get the structure right from the word start, from, 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 from the word go, you're going to encounter different problems later on when you need to shift your funds around, when you need to, uh, then you incur a lot of unnecessary taxes and withholding tax and stuff like that. So that is where Singapore jurisdiction and the way we set up our tax structure makes it a very useful fintech hub or a hub for many things for that matter. So I think going global is interesting in Singapore context because there are a lot of companies in Singapore that are really more of a structured management company but in terms of sales, you will always be in the likes of Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand. Thank you. Um, I guess um, one of the things I'm really interested to hear about now with this uh, global environment is the, the coming back to work piece. Uh, how have you found it with, with your organisations globally in, in getting people back into the office? And is that differing as a global organisation with sort of sets of rules and brand parameters? How are you finding the challenge? Such a good topic, isn't it? I think I don't think you read every couple of days you read about a new tech company changing or implementing or changing their strategy in terms of working from home or flexible working. Um, at Agen, we really value the face-to-face -face time. So we think that we're able to scale and innovate faster if we are together and spend that time. And we don't just mean in the office, we mean that with our merchants and our partners. We mean that with our regional teams and also getting together as a global basis in the Netherlands. So uh, we definitely value the office time. Uh, we have brought in working from the office three days a week. Uh, it's working really well. Uh, we also brought in free lunch every day, which really helped <laughs> to get people into the office. So um, I think being able to encourage people, but always having um, the normal course of life in terms of flexibility is, is important. And as a tech company, I think you have to have that now. I, I think that uh, we, we've adopted a flexible approach, so you could, you could work from home or, or from the office, uh, but certainly it's, it's really meeting the objectives that are required. Having said that, uh, we do encourage uh, two or three days in the office every week and to, to make sure that people do come to the office, we've tried to make the, the offices as conducive an environment as possible uh, for the staff. Do people come in? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, one of the biggest topics uh, when entering this market is which city, be, uh, city to be based in. Um, and so everyone seemingly has a different approach and, you know, some are centric to one city, some decide that there's a rule around the people and have a rollout. But what's your specific approach to, to the Australian market? Uh, for each of your businesses. You can start, Hayley. Yeah, um, it's quite contentious because we're obviously sitting here in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, but we uh, decided to have our office in Sydney and by design, we have the whole team in Sydney. Uh, back to what I said before, we just think it's so important to have um, everyone together. Uh, not to say that's the best solution and mm. whether that works in the future, uh, but for right now, it really works for us. I think we didn't uh, differentiate between the cities, so it's really, uh, are you the right person for the job? You know, do you have the qualification? Can you add value to Transformate? So it, you can be based in Sydney, you can be based in Melbourne. We'll have both offices, we have offices in both countries, both uh, cities, and we'll, we'll continue to take that approach. Poor Adelaide, Brisbane, Perth. Um, so interesting for us perhaps looking at the region more specifically um, in landing in Singapore obviously some people set up licenses but when you start to establish in the region um, are there region, regional nuances you know perhaps in Malaysia or Indonesia where you, you are, you're required to have a country manager or lead in that country as you expand out into the region? I think this was actually earlier echoed by one of our speakers as well that you should always hire local and from not just only in fintech but in all the other trades that I have been in in the past um, I will always strongly encourage companies to hire local because without that, you don't. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you have a Singapore company going to Indonesia and you make a business trip there for a week. You may have you collected a stack of cards or you collected a stack of LinkedIn and they respond to you two weeks later. And they say, hey, I'd like to meet you, Papa. Can I have a catch you? So they call it Papa, you know, it's a way of addressing. Can I catch you for a coffee? 
and oh, let me check my schedule. Oh, all right, I'll be in Indonesia in the next two weeks. Then I'll come down and see you. You know, by then you lost the plot, you lost the, you lost the opportunity. So hiring someone that's local, someone hiring someone who is able to be there to hustle, especially in that part of the world in, in Southeast Asia, where it's still highly relationship driven, you do need someone local there to build the, to walk the ground and to really sow those seeds. Thank you. Um, perhaps for those in the audience that um, are from overseas, um, what are the nuances in terms of how you conduct uh, sales or business meetings that are perhaps different from some of your global experiences? And I know you're fairly vastly experienced in the, in the global uh, remit. So what are the nuances that you see in terms of how we conduct business here in Australia? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I lived in the UK and the US uh, for quite a few years, so it is quite different. Um, I think the great thing about business in Australia is it can be done on quite a casual basis. There's less mm. formality in terms of doing business. Uh, but what's just as important is relationships. And it's not just building those relationships, it's maintaining those relationships mm. over a long time. Um, as we all know, fintech is such a um, small world and everyone moves around into lots of different places, so maintaining those relationships are key. Um, I, mean, I almost throw that question back to you because you work with companies yeah. moving them into Australia and they need to adapt to those nuances here. So what would some of them be for you? Yeah, uh, for me, um, I think probably the biggest thing when you know you've made it in Australia is that you've been invited to a number of wine lunches on a Friday <laughs> afternoon, um, which means you've got deeper into the network than you know, just having a pot or a schooner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of business is conducted in that much more um, you know, friendship type manner. Uh, a lot, obviously, being local here, a lot of conversations start with which AFL teams you support uh, and then broaden out from there. And, it's, it's something that you know it doesn't happen so much in the UK. Whilst soccer or football, as I would call it, is um, is a critical part of the fabric of the culture of the UK, is very very personalised here when conducting business, specifically in in Melbourne and I, I know in New South Wales for the other type of football that that's a different shape ball. But um, uh, for me, like. It's, it's a really interesting battle to kind of make those first five logos and it really makes a much bigger difference I've found than expanding businesses into the UK or US markets in terms of the, the real big difference it makes in terms of that, that sales penetration. PJ, have you got anything else to add? Yeah, uh, we enjoyed the, uh, the open discussions that, that we can have with our, our customers and our prospective customers in, uh, in Australia. They're much more open and uh, we're able to get into the, to the heart of the matter much more easily. So. So that's, uh, that's a very positive thing in Australia. I've been given uh, five minutes, which is great, but uh, as there are people out here that may have questions, I can even run and give the mic to you if needed, just to put him on the spot up there. Um, but is there anyone out in the audience that, um, you've got to run a long way. Do you want me to go? Opposite, feel free to, feel free to stand direction. up if you like. The race is on, Jonathan. I would usually, from my past experience when it comes to doing business, you do have to have market nuances. So before I comment on that, um, I think it's important to do a um, market background knowledge to, to check it up and see what your competitors are offering. And I think more importantly is also the value that you bring. Because if you're in your value proposition, if you already identify that I can save how much of your manpower costs for you, then would that those pricing make sense? I think in Singapore, generally, so long you can articulate the value, because Singapore is a quite a high cost environment. Mm -hmm. So anything that can help a company to save costs and improve efficiency, you will usually be welcome. Um, I, I actually think it is a really interesting point around payments from global first businesses. Is is what uh, currency do you, if you openly um, commit on your website to pricing, which, which currency do you put that up in? Local. Local, wherever you can. Uh, I mean, we, we really look at, because it's a global environment, so it's whichever currency uh, you need to look at, wherever you are. Anyone else with questions out there? Uh, 
Uh, how do you really connect your people globally? Like, how do you encourage a global atmosphere within your workforce? Um, what initiatives are there? What inspires them to be part of, you know, a global enterprise like yourselves? I can start with that. Um, I really think that still com that comes down to culture, mm. right? So understanding what we're all doing when you're working for a company. So understanding the global strategy, the first point. Um, Adyen is unlike any other company I've worked for where previous companies, the strategies changed every couple of years or it's gone another direction or we've acquired companies. Uh, at Adyen, we've had the same strategy um, the whole time. And it's quite a good place to work when you all know you're all on the same road and you all have the same vision. Um, but down in terms of culture is you feel like you're part of an organization even though you're far away from headquarters, and that's all driven by culture, how we communicate each with each other, and how the Adyen formula works. Um, but being able to have those get-togethers regionally on a global basis, and it's not just, you know, it's re reigniting the relationships that you've already built, creating new ones, strengthening what you have, um, and then you really take that back to your office, and then you develop it from there. So I think you have mini culture, and then you have the sort of the global culture as well. I think one of the things that we've seen work really well, especially expanding out wise to create the culture is the commitment from the C-suite from HQ to enter that market within about a 12 month period. And really what that does is align the strategy and the staff to, to really be part of HQ strategy from as early as you can. Obviously in FinTech, it's always sometimes a little bit harder. So when we were launching companies like Square, they needed to get their license. We hired the team a year before they could actually launch and Jack could get out there and they could win their first customers. But certainly that embedment of um, making sure that the founder or the C-suite are committed to the expansion region and actually trying to demonstrate that really does improve and lift up culture, I've always found. Um, now, I think we're um, there or thereabouts. I had a minute, son. Any, any last questions? I think we've nailed it, Jonathan. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks all. all Thank right. you. If, you, if I could Please just have the next... The page, uh, oh, guys, ladies and gentlemen, before I forget, sorry to interrupt, since we are talking about going global, um, we have a Singapore FinTech Festival coming up at 2nd to 4th November in Singapore. So we are looking, expecting 60,000 people to come to Singapore. So if you guys are looking at expanding globally, that would be a good conference to come and attend. Thank you.